to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here alone on Independence Day. Um, sorry, Liberty Larry couldn't be here. He actually um, was planning on skipping his daughter's softball game a couple of nights ago to uh, come over here and record. Um, but instead, he ended up skipping his daughter's softball game to work. So, um, not only did we not get to record, but now he doesn't get to skip another softball game and he had to waste it on work instead of a wonderful podcast for all of you. So happy Independence Day, everyone. Um, happy fourth, uh, may as well start with, I think one of the better pieces of, um, uh, political philosophy out there. I, uh, I've always loved the declaration of course, uh, you know, there was the Lee resolution on July 2nd that I think we've talked about this before that actually officially separated us from the um, uh, from Great Britain at the time. But it's only a couple of sentences that just says we declare our independence more or less. It doesn't really have any commentary about why or um, certainly none of the, the government philosophy that's in the declaration. And I'm doing this from memory, so uh, we're, we're going to call it my version of the Declaration of Independence. But I, this is such an important thing to remember, I, I think, to, you know, to because the United States really was something new. The, the ideas weren't new, but to actually establish a government based on these ideas was. And um, so away we go, right? Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And whenever a government becomes destructive of these rights, it is the duty of the people to alter or abolish it, establishing such forms and under such principles as to them seem fit to secure the liberty for themselves and their posterity. Now, I changed a couple of things there. Um, he does say uh, you have the right to abolish a, a bad government um, rather than the duty, but uh, he uses the word duty later on um, talking about the same thing, so I think it's fair to transfer it up here. Um, also, I think that uh, it's not to establish such forms to um, secure their liberty, although I think that's what he should have said, but I think it actually says something like safety and happiness or happiness and safety. Not that those things aren't important, but um, I, I think that they are a, a secondary pursuit to liberty. I think the one leads to the other, right? Um, yeah. Go back and read it. I uh, <laughs> Also, the whole thing about uh, we, you know, we fought for our independence so that uh, rich white men wouldn't have to pay their taxes, that's hardly it. Um, it seems appropriate na right now, actually, to go back and look at it because a whole lot of their complaints, you know, because the taxes thing was like the 14th point um, in the list. Um, but a, a whole lot of the stuff is about um, uh, use of the military in the states and uh, a lot of it is about how an unfair court system. Um, so, you know, something to bear in mind in, in these, tr these trying times. I'm not sure what to, uh, to start with today. I think in terms of, um, you know, just concern about the, the government in general, 4th of July, I was thinking, so I was in a... Uh, I was watching a stream the other day, um, a game stream, uh, in, in, in the chat room, um, where I don't really participate in the chat room, but anyway, uh, at the end of one of the games, um, somebody said, in the chat room, said something about the stream host's opponent, and referred to the opponent as he. And the stream host says, um, well, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, which is a fair point, we don't, although, you know, I've played this game live too and uh, about 90 percent of the participants are men so it's a pretty fair bet but regardless um he makes that point and then he goes on about how we really should just use they and because 
you know, it's a it's a little thing that we can do, and it's always correct. And I would actually start my dispute right there and say that until very, very recently, they was a plural pronoun. So when you're referring to a single opponent, it would be always incorrect to say they. But we'll let that one go. Times change. Language changes. It's, it's, it's a thing that happens. Um, but he says, that, you know, it's a little thing that we can do to improve the quality of life for some people. And at this point, I was just kind of confused. Like, how does this improve anyone's quality of life? First off, your opponent in an online game is just an av- avatar. You don't actually directly interact with them. They don't know what pronoun you're using. Um, they could, you could be calling them an a-hole. They don't know. They can't be offended because they, they never hear it. It doesn't affect their quality of life whatsoever. It's completely irrelevant. And for the people in the, in the chat who may be offended by such things, I just don't understand how you can be offended on somebody else's behalf. Um, it's not your place. And so somebody in the chat made a comment about this and said uh, that, you know, they, they don't think it's right for anybody to mandate speech from somebody else. Now, he's not talking about specifically a streamer. This, I don't want to go down that road. Anyway, um, he says uh, it, it's not right for uh, speech to be mandated in any way. And if um, somebody is offended by or insulted by how he refers to somebody else, that that's their problem, not his. And I'm assuming that it's a guy. I could be wrong. Maybe I should have said they. Anyway, the stream host says, Well, uh, that is an opinion that you are welcome to have anywhere but here, and banned him. And it was at this point that I got involved, uh, because I couldn't help myself. And I said, uh, Do you not see any irony in um, banning somebody from your channel that has a different opinion than you in order to maintain the diversity of your channel. And uh, he, the stream host, read my comment out out loud and said, wow, you know, I I really thought I had a good chat here, but now I'm rethinking that. And this is where I got really annoyed. And this is one of those things that both the right and the left do, but it's particularly acute on the, the left right now is this, like, moral judgment and self-righteous attitude about what you think. And uh, so this guy obviously knows absolutely nothing about me. And if by some weird coincidence he's listening, um, don't worry, I'm generally not part of your chat. That was, like, the second time I'd ever been on your channel. So um, don't worry about it. I'm I'm not watering down the, the moral greatness of your chat. But... Um, it, th- he, he knows nothing about me, and then he's making this moral judgment of my character uh, because of this comment that I made. And then, you know, somebody in there says something about um, Jordan Peterson, and uh, actually uh, says Jordan Peterson is a, um, a uh, Hitler apologist and a Nazi and so forth. And for those of you that don't know who Jordan Peterson is, um, he was a, a professor in Canada who made the news many years ago when he spoke. He was very vocal, speaking out against the proposition um, that mandated use of the pronoun that the person wanted, um, like under penalty of law. And he's he's actually a liberal, which is the, the funny part. Like the guy is definitely a liberal. If you, if you listen to him, although he's been completely rejected by the left after this incident. And so maybe he's moved a little bit more to the right, just in a realization of what the left was really about. Um, but anyway, um, and so Jordan Peterson's point was that it is dangerous to give government the power to compel speech. And uh, so I, I jumped into the chat and, and said again, um, or, you know, commented on that. And I said, look, this is what Jordan Peterson was arguing about was that it is dangerous to give government the power to compel speech that, um, you know, this is a this is a, a really dangerous precedent. And that, you know, if you're going to talk about what he's doing out there, at least get his argument right. Um, it's about 
government thought control. And the um, stream host again, he reads my comment out loud, and he says in this very sarcastic tone, oh yeah, government thought control, that's what I need to worry about. Yeah, actually, it is. That is exactly what you need to worry about. Um, and then somebody else in the chat uh, said, some, you know, made a comment directly to me that that was a slippery slope argument. Or actually, he said slippery slope fallacy. Now, I don't believe that slippery slope arguments are actually a logical fallacy. Um, I, I could be wrong about that. I can't keep the list straight anymore anyway, but because um, I, I don't gauge, engage in that kind of debate really any anymore. Um, it's always informal. But uh, I wasn't making a slippery slope argument anyway. Um, you know, of course, the slippery slope argument is saying that, well, if you establish this particular precedent, that it could lead to bad things. Um, and while that's true in the case of allowing government to compel speech, uh, that's not the argument that I was making. Uh, I was making the argument that it is bad to allow the government to com compel speech, period. Like right now. Um, not about what it could lead to, but that the uh, using the, the coercive force of government to compel people to speak to each other in a particular way is immoral, period. Like at this moment – without it progressing to anything else. It's not a slippery slope argument. It's an argument that it is immoral to give government the power to, um, under you know, some threat of force, make people talk to each other in a particular way. Now, and I, the, <laughs> the strange thing about it is, is that I, I feel like I could make a slippery slope argument that all of the people that were jumping on me, and I got out of the chat at this point because it was like me against 600 people and I got drowned out pretty quickly, but um, I, I could make a slippery slope argument uh, for this that I think that they would mostly sign on to, um, which is to say, okay, you're content with uh, um, Justin Trudeau um, having the power to use the Canadian government to compel people to use the pronouns that the other people want them to use um, under penalty of whatever, I, I'm not sure what the penalties are, but you know, s surely there's some kind of penalty, like government imposed penalty for not complying. Or otherwise, what's the point of making the law? Um, but you're okay with the uh, you know um, government using its power to make people talk nicer to each other. Uh, but what about when the other side has that power? You know. What if I give that power to to Donald Trump? I suspect that most people in that chat room would have said that that would have been a terrible idea to, you know, allow Donald Trump to determine how we talk to each other. Since, of course, the most awful thing about him is how, uh, how mean he is, or whatever. But what really struck me about it was the you know, the self-righteous attitude about the whole thing. Like, and it's particularly the, the millennial progressive left. This idea that um, that they have discovered the answer, that uh, the answer to all our problems in the world is uh, that we just need to use the right pronouns when we talk to each other. And golly, you old folks, why haven't you figured this out before? Um, and uh, of course, you know, for me personally, if I, and I've had trans friends in the past. Um, you know, I'm certainly willing to call somebody by what they want to be called by. I'm not trying to insult anybody um, in person. Um, but the idea that I would be compelled by government to do so is, is I think, a problem. Um, and it certainly goes against the, you know, the personal liberty that, that we, um, you know, promote here. And uh, you suffer the consequences if you're not polite to people. I, I think, you know, if you um, repeatedly misgender somebody, um, then, you know, and if that's such a grave insult to them, then you might get punched in the mouth. And so be it. Uh, you know, although I don't actually approve of physical violence in response to an insult, um, particularly. But to me, it's just not that big a deal. So I used to work at a call center. And people call me ma'am all the time. I, like, this is one of the things that maybe somebody else can explain to me, because I just don't understand how this is such a grave insult. I used to work at a call center. 
People call me ma'am all the time on the phone. And I didn't even bother to correct them because I don't care. Yeah, you know, This is not somebody that I know. I, I, I will never interact directly with them. Um, well, not likely to anyway. And the only time that I ever got annoyed about being misgendered um, was when one, um, one guy stopped me um, on the phone and said, hey, I'm sorry. Like, I just can't determine from your voice if, if I should say sir or ma'am to you. So what should I call you? And I, I said, I'm, I'm a guy. You can call me sir. And uh, he proceeded on um, with his, I think it was some kind of complaint. I don't remember. Anyway, um, and then he continued to call me ma'am. Now, I was irritated, uh, but not because he was misgendering me. It's because he, you know, he stopped and asked me the question, and he apparently didn't pay any attention to the answer. Uh, but even then, I didn't correct him because I didn't care that much. And so maybe it's just, maybe it's just that I, I don't understand why this is such a grave insult. But the uh, the idea that this is that this actually solves anything, I think. Um, is just uh, is just silly. It's just naive, um, you know. And I, I'm <laughs> I'm not sure how to address it. But the real concern is the idea that, like, that apparently a lot of these people are really content with that the government should be able to compel you to be polite to each other. And uh, you know, that's just kind of scary. This is the this is the next generation. The millennials are a bunch of morons. Um, well, they're not all morons. The problem is the ones that are don't realize it and, in fact, think they're geniuses um, that have finally figured it all out and that, you know, us older folk... And, and I'm from the, the, you know, forgotten middle generation. Um, I'm, I'm Generation X. Nobody knows anything about us. Uh, we just kind of sit there and quietly... We used to be the slacker generation. Now we're Generation X and, and everybody ignores us. That has nothing to do with anything. Um, into actual news, uh, I suppose. There's no way that we can... And we'll probably address this more in the future um, as more information comes out, but probably not. Uh, is the whole... This Russian bounty scandal that's out there right now. And uh, it originated, of course, with a New York, New York Times article. Um, and then there were a couple additional big articles that were written at Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post... And they all reference each other um, as, you know, as proof or support or, you know, uh, additional documentation or whatever. But there's a couple of things that, that should stand out to you in this. Um, first, there were like three people on the main byline and the New York Times and several other people listed at the bottom. If you got half a dozen people listed as uh, authors of an article, that should raise a red flag to you right from the beginning. The, um, the it's just not how journalism is done. Um, the other thing that uh, should raise a red flag to you is the timing. Uh, of course, we you know we have made a deal with the Taliban to get out in less than a year uh, at this point. Um, it's conveniently timed release of this information. And then, of course, there's the big one, uh, that the, the sources are anonymous intelligence sources or anonymous sources familiar with the matter. Um, we don't know anything, anything at all about the source. Uh, we don't even know what agency this source supposedly came from. And, um, it, so it's just... There, there's nobody to blame if it turns out to be a lie. I guess that's really the concern. Um, I, uh, I'm i not really comfortable. Like, I understand the need for uh, use of anonymous sources and leaking um, government misconduct. Uh, I, I get it. But there needs to be a certain level of skepticism. Uh, and if the recent past should suggest that there should that there would be a, a higher level of skepticism than there had been maybe before. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's the other, uh, the other issue about this, which is that the, well, there's, first off, there's only been a few 
um, American soldier death. So the, if the bounty system is out there, it's not working very well. I think um, there were like uh, maybe 19 or 20 U.S. soldiers killed in 2019. Um, there's been four uh, killed in Afghanistan um, this year, four or five, some, somewhere in there. Um, so it, it hasn't been very effective. What's more, uh, we're the invading force. The, the Afghans, the, the Afghan Taliban doesn't really need um, an incentive to uh, kill American soldiers. Like, we're there on their turf, um, and they don't want us there. So there's that. Uh, it's also, of course, um, it, it's rich uh, for the U.S. to um, make an accusation like this to Russia when um, that we're using other international forces to try and, and – or that they're using other international forces to try and uh, attack the Americans – um, since we were in the same country, Afghanistan in the eighties, the U S was supplying, um, these same forces that we're fighting against right now, interestingly enough, um, to fight against the Russians. It was, uh, it was a big new Brzezinski, Brzezinski's, um, you know, big plan to draw the Russians into a, a war in Afghanistan to bleed them out, um, in the same way that that the U.S. had been bled out in Vietnam. In, in fact, his his idea was to give them their Vietnam, um, and it was pretty effective, actually. Um, and, of course, uh, we got the same thing going on in Ukraine, um, where we're helping out the uh, Ukrainian um, separatists against the uh, pro-Russian uh, eastern part of Ukraine and the, you know, the, the Russian help there, although I don't think the Russians are have their own troops in Ukraine at this point. Um, they asked and Putin denied them, wouldn't allow them to be a part of Russia, the eastern Ukraine. We talked about that before. Go back and listen to that episode. But um, something else to think about in this is, uh, well, all right. I Before I get into that, actually, um, I am just floored that there are so many people that want to create a situation that would push us into a hot war with Russia. I just don't understand the what could possibly be gained that would be worth that to anybody in this country. And if you start asking yourself why would the the Russians do this like there's no there's no reason for Russia to to want to um, create a scandal of this level that would kind of demand a response. Like, Russia doesn't want a hot war with us either, uh, or they shouldn't. Um, and so the only other thing that you could think of that the Russians might, the reason that the Russians might consider doing this um, is that they want us involved in Afghanistan. And <laughs> apparently the mainstream response to that is, well, then we should get deep, more deeply involved in Afghanistan. Um, the Russians are, are uh, antagonizing us um, in order to stay involved in Afghanistan, and by golly, we're going to do it. Does, does that make sense to anybody out there listening? If it does, please email me, Michael at the Liberty Mike, because um, I, I don't understand it. But the, to, to risk a hot war with Russia is just... Uh, is just beyond foolishness as far as I'm concerned. There seems to be this idea in the um, military industrial complex that, uh, that well, okay, there is a, a drive to um, maintain the, you know, really expensive um, big equipment military uh, because it generates a lot of money. And in order to do that, these little... Uh, Guerrilla wars aren't really conducive to that that kind of purchasing, you know, with the great big carriers and the, the giant tanks and, the, you know, all these next generation big military equipment things. Um, they, they're not as effective in a guerrilla type war like we have in Afghanistan um, or in uh, North Africa or in any of these other places where we're involved. What you really want is the old style of military conflict, which is the near-peer competitor. You want a big monolithic 
country that's on roughly the same technological level, a little less because you want to win, uh, obviously, that doesn't have quite the same capability of you, but it's, you know, it's enough that uh, to justify a big buildup in armaments. And the, the two best um, competitors or rivals or future enemies for that kind of conflict are Russia and China. And so uh, that's, I mean, that's the drive to make Russia and China the enemy, um, is that it justifies a tremendous amount of military purchasing. As much as anything, I mean, that's as, as good a reason as any that I can come up with. Um, but the idea that that a uh, prolonged conflict with either of those countries um, would remain a conventional war is, is, like I said, it's just foolishness. There seems to be this idea that you could you could have a conventional war with a country like Russia, where the U.S. and Russia both have thousands of thermonuclear weapons, thousands of thermonuclear weapons, and the idea that you could continue a war with them and that nobody would employ those weapons that they're built but they would never be used, it is just it it's a again the height of naivete. I um. The thing about nuclear weapons is that if you're going to, going to engage with nuclear weapons, you don't want to be the second side to use nuclear weapons. And to date, of course, the U.S. is still the only country that's ever used nuclear weapons against another country. Um, but it has to enter into the, the calculation somewhere along the way. You can't just assume that um, – because I do think that in a conventional war – uh, that the U.S. Would, would beat Russia or China. China has several hundred nuclear weapons, by the way. Um, which is more than enough to wipe out the U.S. in any real way. And nobody wins in a nuclear war, and that's maybe why they don't consider it to be an option, because everybody knows that everybody loses. But what about the guy that's losing anyway? Because I do think that we would win a conventional war with Russia. Uh, it would be costly, but it would happen. But at some point, you have to think that the Russians might consider, uh, well, we're, we're losing this, and... Um, the only way that we could possibly conceive of getting out of the situation is to use our nuclear weapons. And if they're not thinking that, certainly people on this side are thinking, wow, Russia's really losing this, and the only way they could possibly consider getting out of this is to use their nuclear weapons, so we better use ours before they use theirs. And it's these kinds of conflicts that are reasons that we should be concerned about the little border dispute between China and India. Um, I, I don't, I don't think at this point that that's blowing up into a real thing, but it's something to pay attention to because that, once again, these are two nuclear armed powers, and I don't see any kind of sig significant conflict between nuclear armed powers where nuclear weapons aren't employed at some point. I just don't. I, I just don't see how that could happen. So it is something to be concerned about. And um, of course, the you know Donald Trump has pulled us out of the of two major nuclear treaties that we had with Russia, um, and uh, the New Start treaty that they're supposed to begin negotiating on, or maybe they already have. Um, he doesn't really want to get involved in that unless we bring China in, but the limitations are also already well above China's stockpile of nuclear weapons, so it doesn't actually affect them. But um, it seems to be an excuse for whatever reason. It may just be that Donald Trump doesn't understand, um, you know, the the reality of this. But um, it, it's an excuse to not get involved or not to you know re renew the treaty. Um, it can be extended for another five years. And from what I've seen, um, the estimates of what China could possibly produce in the next five years still wouldn't reach the the cap that the New START treaty sets um, for nuclear weapons. So even if we got China involved, it, it ha would have absolutely no impact on them. Uh, so now that I've, you know, terrified you with that... Um, I had talked with Liberty Larry about uh, discussing um, the student loan crisis. And this is back to another one of those things that I saw a couple of days ago that uh, irritated me. And this, this has been something of a theme on this podcast that's come up, you know, several times. Um, 
the uh, the point where people blame um, capitalism for something that the government has done. And so th- I'm not going to name the news source where I got this, but there was a review of the student loan crisis, and they brought up some real important points um, of the problems with the you know student loan debt. Um, that it saddles people with a tremendous amount of debt when they're just getting started in life. They can never really, it, it starts them behind the starting line. And, uh, and it's hard to make up for it. Um, and you come out of school, like you've been told this whole time that, uh, and they were focusing specifically on, on race issues with the student loan debt. And, um, they were using some counties in, um, in and around Philadelphia and uh, pointing out how um, counties with uh, mostly white populations had lower student loan debt and lower debt-to-income ratios than um, counties that were uh, mostly non-white. Now, there, you know, and you can make some arguments about whether race plays a part in this, but uh, what they were essentially doing, and this is something that we've uh, that we bring up a lot is that this is a this is an economic issue more than a race issue so they were comparing these fairly affluent counties that happened that uh, that are majority white with these fairly poor counties that were majority non-white and like i said there's you know you can make some arguments about uh, some reasons why that would be and we have and we will again um but uh, essentially, what they were, what their statistics that they were showing sh- proved, is that um, poor people have more debt than rich people. Uh, that's hardly news. I mean, we're all aware of that. But um, the points that they were making about uh, you know student loan debt are are real. Um, you've uh, enticed people by telling them that the only way to improve their situation is to get this education that they can't afford. And the only way that they can get this education they can't afford is to take on these uh, student loans. Um, and then they finish that education and they get out and they have a, uh, a lower middle class job that doesn't actually make up for the amount of debt they took on in order to get the degree in order to get that job. And um, this is a problem. Uh, and of course the, you know, the other point that they made was that this is a a debt that you can't get rid of. Um, and for those that don't know, there really isn't any private student loan system in the U S anymore. It's all, it's all government backed loans. So one of the things that it does is it encourages, um, the lenders to give out riskier loans because the government is, is insuring it. And then of course the, the money that has to be paid back um, you can't bankrupt it away when you owe the government. So um, if you declare bankruptcy, all your debts are wiped except for your student loan debt to the U.S. government. And of course, we're all paying for this when they, they don't make up for it. Um, and it and it ruins people's lives in that way, too. So uh, you always have this debt that reflects on your credit. So the, these are, in fact, all problems. But what bothered me about it is that they, you know, they're talking about that they needed, there was like a two-pronged approach to dealing with the problem, that they needed a a real system of uh, debt forgiveness and um, some uh, government prohibitions on the colleges raising their tuitions. So essentially price fixing for college, right, Um, done by the government. And, uh, and they finish up the report by saying, well, you know, that's capitalism for you. No, it's not. It's not capitalism at all. It's a, it's a, this is an entirely government-run system uh, at this point. Um, it has nothing to do with capitalism. It's, it's cronyism, certainly. Um, I mean, it's, it's certainly not the, f- the free market capitalism that we promote on this show. Um, so y- you have this situation where it, it creates its own problems, um, and they're saying that, they, you know, so the government's created this problem by offering, my answer is to get rid of uh, government guaranteed student loans. Um, that would make some money less available, credit less available for some people. Um, but it would be making credit less available for uh, mostly people that probably shouldn't put themselves in debt in the first place. And there's always 
um, alternative uh, answers to this. Like if you let the market handle it, um, it finds its own ways. Uh, there's grants out there too. Um, you don't just have to take on debt to go to college. Uh, for people that, that show um, that they have a capability, um, there's always uh, some possibilities um, to get some help. Um, and if you, and in fact, most, most schools, you know, offer various scholarships and so forth. So, you know, the education for those that have worked hard and have proven themselves to be capable, uh, will be available. But as far as the pricing is concerned, yes, um, the government backed student loans has driven the price of college up tremendously. And, uh, you know, it's because they're they're guaranteed loans. The government has injected a whole bunch of money into the system, and so all of these colleges are doing everything they can to absorb as much of that money as they possibly can. Um, and uh, because the money is available to so many people, uh, they the college these colleges are making changes and spending money um, in order to draw more students. Not necessarily the best students, just more students. And so the, the money that they're taking in isn't being spent on um, improving the educational system at the college. The money money's being spent on various amenities, uh, pools and nicer dorms and better food and, you know, tennis courts and whatever to try and get more students to come in there so that they can get more students with federal student loans and, and make more money. And as far as the price going up... Um, of course, once again, you know, it's a, a higher demand issue. It's a supply and demand again. Um, so you make all this money available to people, push more people to go to college. Um, more people go to college, the demand for um, for college slots is up, um, and, and it drives prices up. But here's the other thing, and, and so let me give you an example. Because essentially the student loans are saying, you know, we'll pay up to X amount of money for uh, a semester of school. So imagine you go to a used car dealership and you go in there and you announce, I have $10,000 to spend on a car. Do you think that the dealer is going to say, oh, well here, I've got this car over here and it's only 3000 and it would be perfect for you. Absolutely not. Every time if you go in there and say, I've got $10,000 to spend on a vehicle, um, the, everything that they show you is going to be at least $10,000 because why would they leave the money on the table? What they're going to do is they're going to go show you, uh, at, at, at best, they're going to say, hey, I've got this one right here that's $9,999.99. It's just under your budget. That's, that's the best you're going to get out of it. And that's exactly what's happening with these colleges. If the government is, and I don't know what the amounts are that, the government is offering, certainly. So this is just kind of made up numbers. But if the government's offering, is saying, um, we offer loans of up to $10,000 per semester um, for, for school, uh, then what college is going to charge anything less than $10,000 per semester? Why would they leave the money on the table? Because the person that's taking the loan, they're just taking the loan. It's, as far as they're concerned, especially at that age, it's not their money, right? So this is a, a problem that, like, every aspect of this problem has been created by government. Um, saddling st with students with debt that they can't repay um, because they can't ever bankrupt it away because it's a government loan. Um, the Even just the encouragement of college. And, I, I, you know, I went to college, but my college education, it doesn't really have a whole lot of impact on my life right now. Um, there are certainly some things that I learned in college that are helpful. There's a way of thinking about the world, and it was a place where I, I grew up that I, I matured in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that it could have been done a lot of places. Uh, it didn't necessarily need to be college. And it was much more of a maturing thing for me to get out there and work in the world. Because I did two years of college, and then I dropped out, and I went working as, a, as an EMT for a while um, before I went back to school. And the my actual employment did a whole lot more for me um, growing up and understanding the world and learning how to take care of myself than college did, certainly. And the, the education that I got in college, and I value education, you know, I, I read constantly still. Um, I, I almost don't read any fiction anymore. Um, it's, 
it's all me trying to learn more about, well, things that I talk about on this podcast or just general interests of mine. And uh, so I, I certainly greatly value education, but you can educate yourself for a lot less money. Um, what was that thing in uh, that Matt Damon, Ben Affleck movie, Good Will Hunting? Um, where he says he spent $150,000 on an education that you could have gotten for $1.50 in overdue book fines at the local library. There's some truth to that. And people learn in different ways, and so some people it's valuable. And there are specialized kinds of, of careers that I think you know require college. But for the great majority of people probably, or certainly a majority of people that attend college these days, it's unnecessary. You'd be better off going and finding a job in a an industry that you like um, and working your way up and just learning learning your job, um, learning the industry. But the main point there is that, you know, all of these things, um, the rise in prices, uh, the the problems that student loan debt creates for, um, for people, um, all of these things have been caused – by the the government program itself. It's not capitalism. And the answer is definitely not more government. So I think that's all I got for today. Um, and I, I talked longer than I meant to because I, I don't have Gary here to keep me from wandering off and talking about all kinds of things that are completely unrelated to what I'd planned to talk about. So uh, I suppose that that's it. Um, I'm not sure what the schedule is for the next week or two. Uh, I'm supposed to be out of town next week, although it is for the Libertarian National Convention. Um, so I may be able to, uh, to get a, um, uh, a guest host, um, with me, uh, to do a show then, uh, or I may do a show myself or I may just skip a week. And, um, but, uh, I, I hope you join us next time when we finally get this right And in the meantime, try and stay free. Ciao.